now moving on to a presentation by Dr. Aileen Murphy. She's a senior lecturer in the Department of Economics and a graduate of University College Cork. Um, <clears throat> and she's, she's, got a, a, she's done a PhD um, and has also built a successful multidisciplinary academic and industry network sort of um, uh, profession and has uh, done lots of high impact uh, studies that have met journals. And she's very good at uh, doing research and getting good funding for it. So um, Dr. Aileen Murphy is, is a successful uh, researcher and we look forward to hearing her work, which is on investigating the social and economic impacts of COVID-19 amongst cancer patients and survivors. Um, and this is findings from a systematic literature review. So findings from across many studies and bringing them together. And um, as we know, many people have gone through many serious illnesses during this COVID pandemic and isolation can seriously impact on how you go through that illness and how you survive it. And so I think it's a really important study and I look forward to hearing it. Aileen is going to, this is a pre-recorded talk, but she's going to be live for questions afterwards. Thank you very much. So, I'm just going to, our technical team are just going to play this for us. Hello, my name is Dr. Aileen Murphy, I'm a senior lecturer in economics department at Cork University Business School in UCC. And today I'm going to present to you the findings from our systematic literature review as part of the C-COVID-19 project that's funded by the MSD Oncology Policy Grant Programme. So in this systematic literature review, we were seeking to find the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on cancer patients and survivors from an economic and social perspective. So together with my colleagues, Dr. Ryan Kirby from the Department of Economics, also Amy Lawler, the researcher on the project, and Francis Drummond, who's with Breakthrough Cancer Research, our charity partner, we set out to conduct a systematic literature review that examined the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on cancer patients and survivors from a social, economic, health and psychological impacts in both the community and hospital setting. And within this, we were looking at observation studies, randomised control trials, patient perspectives. We excluded the paediatric cancer population, any studies that were published prior to the 1st of January 2020 that we couldn't find in the English language, that looked at the impact on caregivers or nursing or medical staff, and also letters to the editor, case studies, protocols, and short commentaries. We conducted the search at the end of March 2021, so included studies published from the 1st of January 2020 until this period. The search initially yielded over 5,000 manuscripts, and when we compared these against our inclusion exclusion criteria, we ended up with 170 papers, of which three explicitly looked at the economic impacts six social, 44 psychological, 17 telehealth, 18 looked at modelling the effects of COVID on cancer patients and the remainder was looking at the impact on treatments. Considering the geographical spread, many of the studies were from the US, India, China, uh, Italy, Brazil and then elsewhere in Europe. So when we think about COVID and the impact that it had, we need to think about the transitions that occurred. So thinking from a public health perspective, we know that universally there was national responses, stay at home orders were put in place and restrictions on travel. And while this had people staying at home, staying safe, it did reduce their access to primary health care as many primary health care services were closed or perhaps moved to online consultations only or services were redeployed. There was also reduced access and referrals to preventative services, including screening diagnostic services. And the extent of these varied by country. There was also institutional responses. So multidisciplinary task force were set up within hospitals and other institutions in order to manage the response. For many hospitals, this included postponing non-elective treatments in order to manage limited resources and minimize the number of patients attending the hospital. Hospitals in countries that were previously impacted by the SARS outbreak, for example, in the early 2000s, already had such a task force and consequently they responded very well in the early days, whereas other countries lacked this preparedness. And thirdly, then, there was a transition with regards to people's reaction. 
So many patients and their clinical teams had to balance the fear of COVID-19 against cancer progression, making decisions. Fear of clinical environment led health seeking behaviours amongst the population to change, including patients, with some people avoiding preventive and primary care even where they were available. Also, the reaction to move from many consultations to video and telephone was mixed and isolation was a problem for many people. So the result of this then, if we think about the health consequences, thankfully, the res restrictions tended to work. Cancer patients were largely protected from the COVID-19 infection, according to the studies in our report. In some studies, we saw that private hospitals and smaller hospitals were able to maintain the cancer services. But in the majority of studies within the systematic literature review, we found that there was altered treatment strategies. So for example, there was a change in surgeries, a decrease in laparoscopic surgeries and more stoma forming procedures for those requiring colectal surgery, reported in the UK study, for example. There was an increase in the use of new adjuvant radiotherapy for rectal cancer, while they waited for delayed surgery, was reported in the UK, another UK study. Some studies also described a decrease in the number of patients being treated with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And the graph here gives a flavour, the extent to which the number of cancer surgeries decreased during the first wave of the pandemic. So, for example, there was over 60% reduction in the number of neurological and skin cancer surgeries in India and France. Well, in the UK, a study reported a 50% reduction in colorectal cancer surgeries performed during the first wave of the pandemic. Also, we see reductions in head and neck surgical volumes. And while the number of gynecological surgeries overall were not dramatically changed, one UK study indicated that ovarian cancer surgeries were impacted. And then looking at the knock-on effects of this, we've one Turkish study that reported an increased mortality due to these surgical delays. Cancer screening services were also suspended in many countries. And this led to a very large decrease in the number of screening tests being performed in 2020 compared to 2019, ranging from a 30% reduction in breast cancer screening in one study in Singapore to a 92% reduction in colorectal cancer screening in the UK. So as a result of this then, it meant that new cancers being diagnosed were significantly reduced. A UK estimate, for example, found that there was 3,500 colorectal cancer cases were missed during the pandemic. While screening services have begun to resume in the UK and elsewhere, it is at a reduced level compared to the pre-pandemic. And also there's the backlog issues that need to be addressed. And what this means is that cases are likely to be diagnosed at a later stage when treatment is more complex, which of course is going to have an impact on quality of life and survival. Also, during this period, we saw um, recruitment to clinical trials stopping. And of course, the suspension of research to identify and prove effectiveness of new treatment has the potential to impact survival in future years. And also during this period, supportive services were reduced. So here we have this environment where, as I said, there was the national public health guidelines, institutional guidelines, and then we saw um, the population and uh, patient behaviour. So cumulatively, we've seen delays, cancellations and modifications to treatment arising from COVID-19. But what about the social, psychological and economic impact? So within our study, we had uh, 44 studies looking at the psychological impacts. Most of these took a quantitative approach in how they measured the psychological impacts using, for example, the depression, anxiety, stress scale. And across the studies was found that there was an increase in measures such as anxiety, depression, psychological distress and worry. Some studies looked at the coping strategies that patients were using during the period. And they found, for example, that maintaining daily routine, involving hobbies, staying connected with families and friends, and engaging in self-care were important strategies when dealing with the impacts of COVID-19. Overall, however, a heightened sense of fear was experienced by cancer patients. As I mentioned earlier, this is both the fear from COVID, but also the fear of cancer recurrence, disease progression, and many of these arising from delays in treatment. Also, the studies suggested that there was uh, sociodemographic variations. And for example, higher anxiety was found in female patients, those with lower um, household incomes, older or more vulnerable patients, and also those with lower education.
And these were uh, findings for Europe, for example, UK and Italy and also South Korea. Overall, in the population was characterised by a significant mental health strain during the pandemic. One thing that we did see coming arising from the studies was suggestion that patients were involved in the decision making about their treatment and about the modifications, however. Looking then at the societal impacts, so as I mentioned, we had six studies explicitly look, taking a societal perspective. And as mentioned, you know, cancer patients were at risk, greater risk of getting infection with COVID and of developing more severe infection symptoms compared to the general population. So they were advised to reduce their social contacts in cocoon. And the effects here seem to be twofold. So those who did adhere to the guidelines were protected from getting COVID, but they did experience social isolation and loneliness. Then you had another group who were unable to do this because of their economic situation. Also for those who strictly adhere to the guidelines, it did mean less attendance at clinics. We did see that there were social socio-demographic differences here as well. So those aged over 30, lower levels of education, those with work-related commitments, who were reliant on taking public transport to hospital, these were associated with increased risks of delayed care. So we know that the um, both patients, survivors and their families do experience an economic burden associated with cancer. And as our populations age and the rising cost of treatments, we expect this to increase. But what about the effects of the pandemic? So when we think about the economic effects, we need to consider how this is um, intertwined with the social and psychological impacts. And what we found is that we can look at the economic impacts from both an individual perspective and the service level perspective. So from an individual perspective, we saw that there were two main effects, the financial strain and accessing services. So certain subgroups were found to suffer more than others. And this is again where inequalities tended to prevail. Here it was younger workers, males who were married, that they were the wage earner, lower levels of education, lower income, perhaps not able to work from home, had to go out to work, were experiencing um, access issues and also financial strain. Also, if we think about the financial mechanisms that are in play to compensate um, those who were unable to go out to work, who were furloughed, you know, in Ireland we had the um, income protection, so the pop payments, but not all countries had this. Also, if we think about how people are reimbursed for their health service or the, their access to services, in many developed countries and indeed developing countries as well, we have protections in place for the, the people who are very poor, where incomes are below a certain threshold. Often then the higher earners are able to pay out of pocket or pay for private health insurance. But it's that middle group who are just above perhaps the threshold to avail of free services are most at risk of having their access to care be impacted by their inability to pay. Thinking then about the service or the hospital levels, because of the cancellations in treatments, reductions in cancer surgeries and so on, this led to a reduced state reimbursement for hospitals. Also, you had a redistribution of resources towards online technologies. And while this did provide additional support, it also generated cost and time savings from a healthcare perspective, but at what expense to the patient? Also, there was an additional opportunity cost on the demand for respiratory assistance, for example, for COVID patients. So overall, when we think about these economic impacts, we need to think about the impacts on the patients themselves, but also on the healthcare system, particularly where it's a public healthcare system. We know during this time there was an economic disruption from the pandemic also, and a significant contraction in domestic demand which of course then has impacts on the tax intake in public health care systems and the revenue to pay for it. But what we tended to see here was that younger patients, male patients, those on lower income and lower education levels were the most in need of financial services and support. 
And while sociodemographic variables measured for the cancer survivors were rare, um, we did see some differences, particularly older survivors, those who were married, more educated, they were less likely to um, cite financial strain. But what we're seeing here is that there are certain group, subgroups that are more vulnerable, more vulnerable to economic strain than, than others. So the very quick whistle stop tour of the findings of our systematic literature review. We do need to acknowledge that there are some limitations with it. So with regards to timing, what we've chiefly captured is the first wave of the pandemic. Many of the studies we looked at were single institution studies, small sample sizes, and because of the, the differences of the heterogeneity between the studies, it was not possible for us to do a meta-analysis. Also, many of the studies were lacking comparators of the norms. Several studies described modifications or changes to how services were provided. But there was no economic evaluations or cost-effectiveness analysis of any of these alterations. Most of the studies focused on cancer patients. So there's a, a gap in the literature with regards to survivors. And also what we know anecdotally of Irish research observations from Irish data, owing to the parameters in our search, there was no Irish studies included in the uh, literature review. So what we've seen is that the environment in which we've been experiencing since March 2020, the public health guidelines, the institutional guidelines, population's reactions and patient behaviours has had consequences in the delivery of cancer care. This includes delays to treatment, cancellations, no-shows and treatment modifications. And these have psychological, social and economic impacts. We know patients are very worried, anxious, fearing both COVID and their cancer progression. And this is giving rise to anxiety, depression, fear and worry. And also there's a financial burden on patients trying to access healthcare services, perhaps have their incomes reduced, access to finance reduced, which of course is giving rise to inequalities. The reaction in the healthcare service has been to change treatments, modify treatments, change how services are set up, the introduction of hubs, of multidisciplinary teams, moves to telehealth, but also we've seen reductions and closures initially in phase one of screening diagnostic programmes. And we're not yet clear what the long term consequences of this would be. We suspect that it means that we're going to see more complex cancer cases, increased mortality and poorer health outcomes. But is there any lessons or recommendations that we can take from this? So what we saw during the pandemic was that there was a willingness to change and adapt at speed and introduce novel solutions at scale. We saw the shift to using technology and delivering telehealth solutions and also transitions to acute care into the community and the establishment of pathways and hubs. And while some of these were welcomed, they occurred at the speed that we could previously not imagine. And while some of them are suitable, there is challenges going forward. COVID essentially is a, is it was a disruption disruption in how we delivered services, how we access services. And while some of the changes introduced are, are great and very welcomed, they need to be condition appropriate. So how appropriate is telehealth in some situations, is delivering care in, in a community setting. We need to be cognizant of access issues. So who the, the patient population is, how they're going to access these services, be they online or in offsite settings. We know people have altered their health seeking behaviour patterns. How do we combat this? How do we encourage people to, to seek help when they need it, to go for their screening and diagnostic appointments? And how do we get those services back up and running in a sustainable way and also perhaps maintain some of the more useful um, solutions that were brought into place? And all of this requires sustainable and suitable funding. Resources in healthcare are finite. We've had scarce resources for many 
many years and we saw many of the issues we had previous here being exasperated during the pandemic. As I said, there was a willingness to change and to adapt and the commitment shown by healthcare personnel worldwide was phenomenal. But how do we maintain that when we already had issues around retention, recruitment, satisfaction, burnout? And many of these issues are going to be exasperated given the overwhelming demands we put on our staff during the period. And also, we need data. So being able to react, to know what's working, where it's working, and the delivery of cancer services, for this we need real-time data. We saw the geographic variability in the studies included in this review at the outset. And really the availability of data impacts on both the quality of those studies being available and the studies themselves. So we need data to be able to make decisions and having healthcare IT systems that are appropriate to deliver this data that's sufficient, that's connected um, in real time is really important. So thank you very much. My details are here if anyone would like to get in touch, more information, I'm happy to take any questions. Aileen, you're welcome to the conference. Thank you so much for your address. It was really interesting. And um, we just heard about how um, stress affected um, nursing staff and every aspect of their life. And here now we hear how it's affected, you know, the COVID and, the, and all that it's brought has affected cancer patients individually and actually potentially in the future. And it's a really interesting challenge that we have to face and address. I was wondering, did you, um, it, did you find there was any positive experiences that cancer patients noted in any of these studies or was it all challenge and, and you know, negative? things that, that were brought to them. Thanks, Anna. I suppose, um, yeah, we have looked at this in perhaps quite a, a negative lens. Um, and I suppose the, the impacts that we were looking for um, was showing that they, these impacts of being at home, being isolated, um, the, the loneliness that, that was there. I think a, a key positive was um, how few COVID infections in that first period that were found that the protections put in place were working, um, which is a positive. But of course, then we have the more longer term impacts on delayed diagnosis, worsening prognosis, and then the social and psychological impacts of that as well. Yeah, that's, it's really very interesting uh, times. And uh, I think we have a lot of healthcare challenges in front of us because of that. And um, would anybody, does that, would anybody from the audience, has anyone a question that they'd like to ask Aileen? John has a question. John. Well, Nick, thank you very much. That was a very good talk. Uh, you mentioned the opportunities. Can you hear me? Yes, I will. I'll repeat the question yeah, to the audience. The opportunities uh, that, that, that offer themselves, and one was willingness to change. Now, it is the human condition not to wish to change at all. Were there any positive things that came out of that willingness to change? Um, just for the audience at home, John's asking, were there any people are, were willing to change but often are not? Were there any positive um, observations that came out of that willingness to change that Dr. Murphy came across in her studies? Thanks, John. Um, I suppose so. As I said at the outset, we were looking really at the, the impacts on patients. But indirectly then, of course, we were looking at what changes had taken place. So, you know, while we know there's issues with telehealth, for example, and I see Chris is speaking about this later on, um, you know, it's not ideal in every situation, but the, the adaptation or the introduction of that was quite um, positive. And while we didn't look explicitly at, you know, how willing people were to do it, we saw that it did occur and had um, positive benefits for people, depending on the stage of, um, of their treatment, the types of services it was being used for, um, we saw mentioned that it was used, for example, multidisciplinary teams. I know um, Teresa mentioned the, the curse of the WhatsApp groups, um, but, you know, the, there are some benefits um, to communicating in, in that way of bringing people together at a time when they're told to stay apart. Um, so to aid communications. Um, so that was one area, I suppose. Also, we saw the introduction of pathways and hubs for delivering treatments. Um, again, you know, I suppose we can only 
speak for our own experience too. We, we see how long it takes to get things up and running, to get policies written, strategy documents written. Whereas we saw that that adaptation of introducing these solutions um, occur quite quickly when, when they had to occur quickly. Okay. Thank you very much. May I ask one more question? I was just wondering, when you did the study, was there anything particularly that you were like, gosh, I really hadn't expected this to come out of the study? Was there a surprising finding for you? Um, I think the volume of, of papers that have been published in such a short period um, from a methodological perspective um, really stood out to us. And also the, the geographical dispersion of, of, you know, what a lot of the studies were by clinicians um, and, and clinical teams and to see that the, the pace and speed at which they were able to, to get research out. And I know that from your um, opening address earlier about talking about research and having research being done timely um, and, and current. So often when we think about research, we think of a lag that is after the effect and we're retrospectively looking at things, but that was something that really stuck out to us that, that that's the pace at which people were able to to get findings out and we know they're with limitations and the lack of controls and but given the types of studies that they are and I think that comes back again to the readily available availability of data um, mm -hmm. to be able to have that data in real time and analyze it relatively quickly and you know as you said the the pandemic has shown that we do need access to to evidence um, but timely access to evidence as well so we can inform decisions and inform practice when we need it you know in There'll be lots of analysis done over the, the next decade and beyond um, for how we reacted and what we did well and what we could have done better during the pandemic. But I suppose the reality is decisions have to be made now. So having this kind of evidence available um, and then we hope our study will add to this by summarising this evidence and that will be of use to those who are trying to make decisions in real time, improving the delivery of health services and ultimately health outcomes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what you've done is when you bring together all this literature and can draw conclusions from them together, it's really, really helpful because a small study can tell you so much. But when you see data brought together, it, it does really is so much more informative. So thank you very much for your study. It's been really interesting um, to hear, to hear some times how it backs up what we believe is happening, but also to hear about the role of, of research and the challenges that lie in front of us. So thank you so much. May I just say that you're, I, I, you're, I garbled the introduction of Dr. Aileen <laughs> Matthew and uh, the senior lecturer in the Department of Economics at UCC. Um, she's written several articles and reports on health technology assessments and acute, uh, uh, evaluations and has also advised NHS Scotland. So she's got a huge um, sort of professional body behind us. So thank you so much. Thank you.